to that Beulah land. We're going to do and we're going to get there in Jesus' name. The mixed multitude, remembering the cucumbers and the onions of Egypt, will not influence us. Those who are looking for only the mundane things of this life will not influence us. Those who want the church to be like a crippled, anemic denomination, not having backbone or strength, not having holiness or righteousness, all those anemic people, the mixed multitude, will not influence us in Jesus' name. We we'll pitched our tent on Beulah land. And that place, we're going to settle there. We we'll pray that this time now, as we come to your word, you strengthen us in the inner man in Jesus' name. Lord, we know you have not finished walking in us and us and through us. We pray everything that still needs to be done. Do everything. Until you can see the reflection of the glory and the image of Christ on every one of us. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Exodus chapter 32. You see the title or the topic we're dealing with on the Lord's side. You see the quotation marks around those words. Because they are taken directly out of the Bible. Exodus chapter 32 verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? That's the question. Who is on the Lord's side? The question is, what brought that question to the mouth of Moses to declare that to the children of Israel? I need to tell you the story. Look at chapter 32 verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, oh, make us gods, we shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, well, what not, we know not. What is become of him? That was the genesis of the problem. God called Moses to come to the mountain top to receive the law, the Ten Commandments that will guide the children of Israel and show them the right way they should go. The Lord did not tell him he'll be spending 40 days there so he could not tell the children of Israel. He didn't know actually how long it would take him to be there. A week passed, two weeks passed, three weeks passed, four weeks passed on, fives, and almost six, and he wasn't back. So the children of Israel said, as for this Moses that took us out of Egypt, taking us to the land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey, we have not seen him, so we don't know what has happened to him. To start with, they thought it was Moses that brought them out. They didn't understand it was God, the power of God, the purpose of God. The fulfillment of the promise and the plan of God unto Abraham that brought them out. And so they said, because we don't know what has happened to him. Because gods, they knew what they were doing. They knew it was to be a god of their own making. An idol. Like they worshipped in Egypt. That these gods now will lead us to where we're going. To, to cut a long story short, Aaron, older than Moses, more eloquent than Moses, probably more intelligent than Moses, Aaron, the high priest of the people, we can say, 
almost like the right hand man of Moses. He yielded. Aaron did not have the backbone to stand. Aaron did not have the backbone to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the people of God. And so you find in verse 2, And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, and of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and they brought them unto Aaron. You know, backsliding also has a price to pay. You don't just backslide that, that, you know, free, freely. They have to pay a price. They have to bring their gold, their treasure, to make an idol. Idol worshippers pay a price. Backsliders pay a price. And backsliders pay a price now to maintain themselves in backsliding. And they're going to pay the eternal price of suffering in hellfire as a result of that backsliding. Backsliding as a price, sinning as a price, living and going back to Egypt as a price to pay. And so they paid the price and he received them in verse 4 at their hand and fun functioned each with a graving tool after he had made it a molten cow and the search uh, can you say it's a you know real work you know to fashion that cow that's work and to use the graving tool that's work the people that will not give their mind, their intelligence, their skill, their ability, their experience, their training to serve the Lord. They will give their skill, their intelligence, their ability to serve the devil. And here we find what he did. And now he called them and said, These be the gods, O Israel, that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. What a lie. False religion is all lying. Backsliding is living out a lie. Idol worship is living out a lie. The new who performed those ten miracles in the land of Egypt. The new who divided the Red Sea. The new who gave them manna every day. The new who gave them water out of the rock before this time. But now they turned around. What a lie. If you backslide, you maintain your backsliding by a system, a series of lying. When you tell one lie, you have to have another lie to cover it up. When you commit one sin, you have to have a lie to wrap it up. When you go to worship idol, you have to have some lie to still look good in the public and cover it up. And then it goes on in verse 5, and when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. Uh, can, can you imagine the high priest of the children of Israel building an altar unto this idol they just made? And you know, that, that is something, that's what happens. That's why this church might be very careful who we appoint to be an overseer in a region. We must be very careful who we appoint to be an overseer in a state. We must be very careful who we appoint as overseers in any country. We must be very careful who we appoint to lead the people of God in any, in any church, any local church, and of course at the headquarters church here. Aaron was a man of the people, not a man of the world, not a man of the book, not a man of holiness and righteousness. It was a man of the people and you have to be careful about the people who cherish the people more than the doctrine who cherish and protect the desires of the people the likings of the people a person that will do anything even bring the church back take the church back to egypt so that it can remain popular among the people that was what Aaron did. No backbone, a jellyfish 
an amphibian. When Moses is there, it's all for Moses. When Moses is not there, it's all for the people. And it goes on to say, he proclaimed a feast. And said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. In verse 6, and they, and they rose early on the morning. And offered bunch of rings. And brought peace of rings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink. And rose up to play. Of course, worldliness, what are you talking about? Every other thing followed. Idolatry had come. Backsliding had come. Apostasy had come. All that remained nice to bring everything that was in Egypt and bring it to their midst. But the Lord knew. And the Lord alerted Moses and spoke to him. And the Lord actually decided what the judgment will be. Look at verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down. For thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Satan didn't corrupt them. They corrupted themselves. When you bring back the thoughts of Egypt, when you bring back to your mind your practices in the world before you became a Christian, when you bring back all the things you used to do at your stage, in your time of degradation and defilement, and then you slide back, you go back. Don't accuse Satan, it's you. They have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside, verse 8, quickly, out of the way, which I commanded them. They have made a molting calf. What can you do that the Lord will not know? What backsliding can you hide under cover that God will not know? What places can you go to? What people can you contact? What thoughts can you have? What action can you put in place that the Almighty God will not know? Of course, He knows. And he knows exactly the consequence of what you have done. He says they have worshipped it and they have sacrificed thereunto. And said, These be thy gods, O Israel, that have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it a stiff necked, stubborn, self willed, adamant stony heart people now therefore let me alone that my rod may wax hot against them and that i may consume them and i will make thee a great nation and moses besought the lord his god and said lord why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people which thou hast brought forth out of the land of egypt with great power and with a mighty hand he began to plead for them in fact he pleaded for them to the point he said look at verse 32 verse 31 Moses returned unto the Lord and said oh these people have seen a great sin and have made them gods of gold Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, he didn't complete the sentence, he just went on to say, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Verse 33, And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever, Aaron, Whosoever, all those elders and leaders of the tribes of Israel, whosoever, any member of the commonwealth of Israel, whosoever, the high or the low, whosoever, public figures or private individuals, whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. We tells us God writes names in the book of life. 
the moment you get born again the moment you give your life to christ the moment you surrender to the lord he writes your name my name is written down my name is written down in that book of the lord my name is written down but now he says whosoever have sinned against me i will blot him out of my book it was a great sin to lead the whole nation back to idol worship is a great sin and when any preacher a man of the people when any overseer a man of the people when a woman leader a woman of the people would lead any group of people five or ten a hundred or one thousand or a whole region lead them back to denominational idolatry what we used to do where we used to be is a great sin and god says whosoever have sinned against me him will i blot out of my book the lord wanted to destroy the whole nation but now moses began to pray for them after praying for them and the lord said i'll do as you have said but the people that have done evil that have replaced me with those idols of gold they're not going to go scot-free i'll punish them that's why moses now turned to the people come back to verse 26 and moses stood in the gate of the camp he couldn't identify with them anymore he couldn't stay with them anymore he separated himself that's the first step if you are really of the mind of Christ and you are willing to honestly contend for the faith. If you are going to help the backsliders, the very first step is to come out from among those backsliders and say, I cannot identify with you. I cannot stay with you in your state of backsliding, in your program and part to apostasy. And so because of that, he came outside the camp. And what, you know, what a man Moses was, what a leader Moses was, single-handedly to declare to them, this is evil. And you see the Lord still a communication with Moses because God knew his heart. He knew his stand. You will not compromise with those compromisers. Therefore, he stood at the gate and said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Verse 29. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves to today to the Lord, even every man upon his son. Moses told them, If your son is not willing to return, Consecrate yourself to the Lord and put the pressure on that child. If your wife is not willing to come out of that backsliding and apostasy, take your stand. Consecrate yourself this day unto the Lord. If it's your husband that says, we've done it, we've done it. We're going to worship idol. Doesn't matter. If the closest friend intimate friend to you will say we have gone the way of Egypt we're going to remain in Egypt it says consecrate yourself this day unto the Lord in verse 29 it says even every man upon his son and upon his brother that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day on the lord's side on the lord's side there are three things we're looking at number one the great invitation number two the great instruction number three the great impartation number one the great invitation come who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. That's a great invitation. It was an invitation given to the whole nation. 
an invitation given to all the tribes of Israel. An invitation given to everyone, whosoever will may come. Who is on the Lord's side, let him come unto me. I will not come unto you. I will not bow down to what you are bowing down to. If you are now on the Lord's side and you are willing to repent, come. The great invitation, come. Number two, the great instruction, consecrate. The great instruction, consecrate. Let everyone come in. Everyone that is making up his mind, show it by the consecration, the commitment, the absolute surrender, absolute ownership of the Lord himself. That you say, I come, Lord, I come. You are part of the backsliding. You are part of the apostasy. You are not going to be apathetic, neutral. There's no neutral ground. You will then come to the Lord and consecrate this day yourself unto the Lord. And you promise him that never will this happen again. No going back to Egypt anymore. The influence of Egypt, the influence of the Canaanites, the influence of the Moabites will not have anything to do with you anymore. The great instruction, consecrate. Number three, the great impartation covenant. Make a covenant with the Lord and be bound to the Lord. Make yourself a bundle of sacrifice that you lay on the altar of the Lord and say, Lord, from now on, till I see the Lord face to face, there will be no going back anymore. Here I stand and there is what I do. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. That you make a commitment, a consecration unto the Lord. No going back anymore. Look at those three things one by one. The great invitation come. The great instruction consecrate. The great impartation covenant. Number one. The great invitation it tells us in Exodus chapter 32 verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? It's going to be a personal decision. Who is on the Lord's side? It's going to be a practical decision that you demonstrate it. You show it. And it is coming from your very heart. It's going to be a purposeful decision. There is a purpose in this. I want to be attached to the Lord. Intimate with the Lord. Committed unto the Lord. I want to separate from the backsliding nation. And I want to just bind myself unto the Lord with an everlasting covenant. Who is on the Lord's side. And then it says, let him come. If you're on the Lord's side, don't just stand there or sit there. Let him come. You see, that puts motion, motion in your spirit. Motion in your heart. You're looking up and you're going to that place where you ought to be. Where you should never have departed. And you say, yes, I come. Yes, I come. It is not just that you are making the motion in the physical, in the spiritual, in your mind, in your heart. It's a decision that is backed up with a determination. And you're saying, whoever is affected by this, whoever loves me, whoever hates me, whoever comes to me, whoever separates from me, whoever favors me, whoever disfavors me, that will not matter. My goal is heaven. And my goal is the Beulah land. And because of that, I make up my mind, Lord, I come. Lord, I come. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me and the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. Though no one goes with me. 
still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. God is preparing a kingdom. I will be there. No turning back, no turning back. It is that kind of commitment that Moses was calling the people to. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. First Kings chapter 18. First Kings chapter 18. Reading from verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long? How long? How long halt ye between two opinions? Are you confused? Which one is greater, the God of heaven or the gods of Egypt? Are you confused? Which one is greater, the power of God or the power of those Egyptian magicians? Are you confused? Which one is mightier? The God of heaven that calls us unto himself. And he says, this is the way to go. And he gives us the watch, the commandment, and he makes a covenant with us. Or oh, the gods of this world that eventually will be packed up and will follow Satan to hellfire. Are you confused? Elijah was asking the people, where do you stand? And he said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. Guilt silenced them. The condemnation that came to them silenced them. As they looked over their lives and they saw that their actions had brought three years of farming on the land. The suffering. The result and the consequence of their apathy or their apostasy silenced them. They couldn't answer a word. And as the Lord is asking you today, he saved you. He healed you. He delivered you. When you came to the Lord, maybe you are not married, now you are married. When you came to the Lord, no children, now you have children. When you came to the Lord, you, you know, didn't have any certificate, uh, now you have certificate. When you came to the Lord, no land, no property, nothing. Now you have all this, and now if your mind is going back to Egypt, if your mind is going back to the gods of the Moabites, if your mind is going back, to Egypt's land, the Lord is asking, why hold you between two opinions? Who has done all this for you? What has Satan done for you? And guilt and condemnation will close your mouth. There will be nothing to say because you know that you have degraded yourself to go back into the old way. But now there's a challenge. We're looking at that, chapter 18, verse 22. Then said Elijah unto the people, I even I only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks. And let them choose one bullock for themselves. And cut it in pieces and lay it on wood. And put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and call ye on the name of your gods, those gods of gold and gods of gold, and gods of stone and gods of wood that you have made. And I will call on the name of the Lord, and the Lord that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first. For ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, your idols, and put no fire under. And he took the bullock which was given them, and he dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon. Say, O Baal, hear us. And there was no voice nor any that answered. 
and they leaped upon the altar that was made and it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said cry aloud for he is a God either he is talking or he is pursuing or he is in a journey or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake this is a serious moment for your God to respond he must do something if he's a God the challenge is right before him he must do something and in verse 28 and they cried aloud and caught themselves after their manner with the knives and lancets until the blood gushed out upon them and it came to pass when midday was past and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Don't let anybody deceive you by prophecy. They prophesied to you. Don't any, let anybody cajole you, cover you with a blanket of false doctrine by prophecy. They prophesied here too, but there was no fire. And there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. The great invitation, Come. Elijah now to tell the people, Come near unto me. He was telling them to be decisive. Decide. You have seen the failure of the prophets of Baal. You have seen the failure of this idol and this God that the people made unto themselves. Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the watch of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and he cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill for barrels with water, and pour each on the on the bond sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench. We say there also with water, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art the and thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. The point is one man, one solitary man, one individual that sets his face to get to the land of promise can do a lot in bringing many others to that same land of promise. One person that loves nothing, no one above God. One person consecrated and committed to see the good old days. One person that lays everything on the altar. Not a friend to Ahab. Not a friend to Jezebel. Not a friend to the idol worshippers. Not a friend to any compromiser on earth. One person can do a lot to bring the whole nation back unto the Lord. And here is what you find in Elijah. That as a solitary individual, he did all this by himself. And he said, Lord, answer. Let the people know that was still the God the living God, the everlasting God, the one who changes not. Let the people know and let them know that I am thy servant and that I have done all things, all these things according to thy word. Hear me, verse 37, O Lord, hear me. 
that these people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. They had gone astray, they had backslidden, but now that you have turned their hearts back again, then the fire of the Lord fell, the fire will fall. When you lay everything on the altar, when you commit yourself to the Lord, when you say there is no going back, there's no compromise, when you say there is no cutting of corners, when you say all I am, all I have, all I have ever been, I lay on the altar for the Lord and I'm going to obey the word of God, every jot and every teacher by the sustaining, empowering grace of God. And you say, Lord, I don't have any friend that is so strong. I don't have any acquaintance that is so strong that will shift me and turn me away from following after you. When you lay everything on the altar like that, the fire will fall. And it says, and the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the bond sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the doors and licked up the water that was in the trench and when all the people saw it they fell on their faces and they said the Lord he is God the Lord he is God but that's not the end if you really mean that if you know that you have really come back to the Lord are we going to coexist with the worshippers of Baal if we say we have come to the Lord if we say we are now going to serve the Lord and him, him alone, are we going to say we have our altar here, Baal worshippers have their altars there? Do you have the backbone to deal with evil? Do you have the conviction to deal with evil? Do you have the determination, the consecration to deal with the mixed multitude and the people who have gone back that brings us to verse 39. It says, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and Elijah was saying, you'll have to do more than that. Just fall in your face. You'll have to do more than raising up your hand. You have to do more than shouting, the Lord is God, the Lord, he is God. What did they have to do? Verse 40, and Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and slew them there. That's the implication of saying that you know that this God is the only one we're going to serve. You destroy evil, idolatry completely. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55. What are you doing from verse 3? Isaiah 55, verse 3. Incline your ear and come unto me. The great invitation, come, incline your ear, come unto me, here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Verse 6, seek ye the Lord, while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. That's, what, that's the implication of coming. It's not just that I come, and I come with all my sins and all my defilement, all my degradation, all my commitment to the other gods, and I mean to still keep all that with me and protecting them, but I still come. That's no coming. If you're going to come, it means that all of sin will be behind you. All of compromise will be behind you. All of idol worship will be behind you. All the jewelries of Egypt, all the garments of Egypt, all the regalia of Egypt, all the appearances of Egypt, all the slacks of Egypt, and all those defiling abominable things to put 
on your eyelashes and on your head, all the attachment, everything will have to go. That you say, I am coming to the Lord. Let the wicked forsake his way. All the bottles of alcohol, all the packets of secret, all that will have to go. All the covenant with occultic gangs, all that will have to go. All the practices of the world, all the celebration of the world, all that will have to go. The mind of Egypt. The principles of Egypt and the perversions of those Egyptians, everything will have to go. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the righteous man is thus, and let him return, return, return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 16. Isaiah chapter 1. Reading from verse 16, wash you, make you clean. You want to appear before the Lord, wash you, make you clean. Then he goes on to say, put away, put away. It's a deliberate act. It's, a, it's an act you determine, practical. It has to be done, put away. The evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widows. You know what he's saying? He's telling us that even in our evangelism, there are some people that we don't think, we don't understand. It's backsliding. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There are some people that say, well, preach the gospel to every creature. Let the other people do that. And we neglect the poor. We neglect the homeless. We neglect the fatherless. We neglect the widows. We neglect the orphans. We neglect the oppressed. We probably even oppress them too, ourselves. And we're only trying to reach out to the very minority in any community. The rich and the minority. The highly placed and the minority. There are people that just, that's, that's all they do. They don't want to, you know, have anything to do with the fatherless and the widows and the orphans and the deprived and uh, the oppressed in the land. And it says, if you're coming to the Lord, when you first came to know the Lord, what was your mind? Did you just concentrate on this as the only one percent of society I can only talk to? We opened our gates and opened our mind and opened our ministry to everyone. Then he goes on to say, learn to do well. Learn to do well. Come now. Come now. If you've done verses 7, 16 and 17, come now. If you have repented of your sin, come now. If you have thrown away all those connections, all the covenant with evil practices, come now. If with all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, you are now sold to the Lord, come now. If idol has become nothing, if you say idol is a non-entity, a non-entity, if you say all those all the gold of Egypt, all the silver of Egypt, they mean nothing to me. If you have made up your mind in that in that way of total repentance, then you come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, and though they be red like crimson, it says they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Well, I don't want to eat the good of the land, so I want to continue my way. He said, you're not going to be neutral and go scot free. Look at verse 20. But if you refuse and rebel, if you say, no, we have loved idols, we're going to keep on loving idols. We're backsliding, we're going to remain backsliding. We're into apostasy, we're going to remain in apostasy. They're calling them to repent. I'm not part of the people they are calling. If you refuse and rebel, then it says, He shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. We're looking at uh, chapter 26 of 
Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 20. Isaiah chapter 26 is the great invitation. The great invitation. Come. Isaiah chapter 20, 20, 26, verse 20. Come. My people, you've gone astray. Come. My people, you've come back into the world. Come, my people. All the appearances of Egypt and the celebration of Egypt is now upon you. Come now, my people. And all the merriments and all the drinking and all the, you know, all the festivals of Christmas. By the way, you, you, I think you ought to know we, we never, never cease. This uh, ministry started, we have never said we're going to Christmas retreat. Never. We don't celebrate Christmas. It actually came from idolatrous background. And that's why you never find us in this church singing what they call Christmas carols. Never. We always say it's December retreat. It's a December getting together just december we're just gathering together because of the holiday period so that we can reconnect ourselves to the lord more and we can give everything we have to the lord more when you find any section of the church anybody coming in and wants to introduce the idolatry of mystery babylon that we call christmas and I want to bring all the Christmas carols and everything. And they're saying that this is the day Jesus was born. You don't find that in the Acts of the Apostles. You don't find that in the early church. You don't find that in deeper life either. And whether it is the youth section, or it's in the you know school section, deeper life high school, or it is a campus, or it is, you know, a, a lot. we sing gospel songs, gospel songs. And, uh, you know, we don't go into all those things. If you didn't know that before, now you know. And it says that now you've made up your mind and you have seen that, you've seen all the ways we're scattered abroad everywhere into this, into that. It says, now come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy door about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. The great tribulation is about to strike this world. And the Lord is saying, Come and enter into the chamber. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood. And shall no more cover her slain. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 17. Wherefore come out from among them. That's a great invitation. It draws through from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Come out. Out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Be ye separate, says the Lord. That's what some people, some Aaron's, are fighting against. And they say, We'll change this church. No, you will not. No, you will not. Don't allow God to change you before you change his church will make this church to be known to the world like we're just like them no we're not like them we want to convince the world that there's nothing peculiar about us no there's something peculiar about us and if that is your mind want to place the church on the map and we want the world to know we're friendly we're not separatists. Yes, we are. We're separatists. Those who are going to heaven, they're different from the people of the world. And the Lord himself has commanded, what project are you giving yourself? The project to make the church look like the world? The project to remove what you call the rough edges in the church? And the separatist stand in the church. 
and the unworldly attitude in the church and then you're giving yourself a project fighting against God here is the word of the Lord come out from among them and be separate if your intention is that you know your presence here in the church in deeper life is to turn the church little by little little by little until we are acceptable to the world maybe you'll need to check out and go to another place here we're not trying to make the church look like the world we're going to we're trying to see how the church will become more and more like jesus christ more and more like people like enoch like stephen more and more people like a Paul the Apostle, more and more, the saints of the Bible. That's a goal here. If you have another goal, it's either you repent and say, Lord, now I understand. I want to line up. If you're not going to line up, we'll give you permission. You can go any other place because here, the word of God we have, which we're going to follow, is come out from among them. And be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and my daughter says the Lord Almighty Revelation chapter 18 I'm reading from verse 4 Revelation chapter 18 reading from verse 4 come the great invitation Revelation chapter 18 verse 4 and I heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people that she be not partakers of her sins, and that she receive not of her plagues. Point number one, the great invitation come. Point number two, the great instruction, consecrate. The great instruction, consecrate. We're coming to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. We're reading the first part of verse 29. Exodus 32, verse 29. It says, For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. Consecrate yourself today unto the Lord. That's what the Lord is looking for. God gave all he had for your salvation. In response, you must give all you are, all you have unto the Lord. You'll forget your position. In fact, that position, you lay it at the feet of Christ. You forget your title. You lay that title at the feet of Christ. You forget all your ambitions that you had before and you still have today and you lay that ambition at the feet of Christ. Consecrate this day yourselves unto the Lord. And we're told in verse 26, And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves unto him. Those were the people that responded to that call to consecration. In Numbers chapter 8, verse 11. Numbers chapter 8, verse 11. Consecrate, consecrate. Chapter 8 of Numbers. Verse 11. And Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord. Aaron shall offer not an animal. Aaron shall offer not their regular offering and sacrifices. Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord for an offering, for an offering for the children of Israel that they may execute the service of the Lord. The Lord now had total control over their time, total control over their strength, total control over their skill, total control over their ability, total control over everything they had, everything they were, everything they possess, the consecration that the Lord himself called the people to. And as the consecration is calling us to, it's not going to accept just a part of our lives. It's not going to accept just a portion of our lives. It's not going to accept just a little. He wants everything. He gave up himself. 
and he gave up himself completely and totally and because he gave up himself totally and completely he's expecting that you too in response to his sacrifice on the cross of calvary you will give yourself completely totally unreservedly wholeheartedly unto the lord that is what he expects let me illustrate it to you in the word of god and see what this implies in first kings chapter 20 consecrate the great instruction consecrate we're looking at first kings chapter 20 verse 4 and the king of israel answered and said my lord o king according to thy word i am thine and all that i have that's consecration you say to the king of kings to the lord of lords i am thine and all that i have uh, you know many years ago in our land here they used to think that those who did not go to school might be preachers if you couldn't do any other thing you couldn't you know be a good trader a good merchant man a good teacher a good doctor a good engineer a good professional then you know your last bet your last shot will be go to the church and do something there they thought that the church should you know have all the people that couldn't make it any other way in life until some people in our land after they've gone to educational system they've been educated they're not willing to give everything to the lord and we have a number of people who are preaching now in our land or actually have gone to all these uh, institutions the people that realize that only the best is good enough for god that will bring everything you've got and you lay it at the feet of Christ that Jesus Christ though he was rich he became poor for our sake so that he can bring God to God if Christ has done that for me if Christ has done that for you there is nothing you are holding back from the Lord you want to consecrate and yield everything you have everything you are unto the Lord in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're looking at verse 3. The total commitment, the total yieldedness, the absolute surrender. The Lord is calling every Christian to no sin, no evil, no degradation, no defilement, nothing contrary to the will of God or word of God in your life and then while well, you are cleansed and purged and sanctified and made holy that sanctified vessel you commit to the Lord that sanctified life you commit unto the Lord second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 3 for to their power I bear record yea and beyond their power they were willing of themselves and praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints and this they did not as we hoped but first they gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God willingly offering themselves all they had all they possessed all they were all the experiences everything they laid upon the altar they were not doing that as a favor to anybody they were doing that as a response of gratitude to the Lord because of what he has done for me this is what I too will do. Judges chapter 5. In Judges chapter 5, reading from verse 2, willingly offering ourselves before the Lord, consecration. Judges chapter 5, verse 2, praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves when the people each of those people in the land of israel 
not waiting for Barak, not waiting for Deborah, not waiting for any other person. This is me. My salvation is personal. And my sacrifice, my consecration will be personal. I'll not be waiting for so and so, such and so, to see how much they are offering to the Lord before I offer myself. Everyone, they will offer themselves unto the Lord. Verse 9, verse 9, my heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. You see, at the time of Deborah, what they did is that they just offered completely unto the Lord. Oh, it's costly. It's costly. It's costly. It's going to cost you something. But it cost Jesus Christ everything. For him to go to the cross and to die for you, it cost him everything. And because of that, you want to realize it cost you something too. In second Samuel, second Samuel, I'm reading here from chapter 24. Second Samuel, chapter 24, and we're reading from verse 24. It says, And the king said unto Arauna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price, consecration at a price, yieldedness at a a prize totally devoting yourself to the Lord at a price. There's some people that they are willing to give whatever it is to the Lord if it doesn't inconvenience them, if it allows them to remain in.